Dive In. Bienvenidos a Dive In. Vitajte na festival Dive In. Welcome to the Dive In Festival. Dive in. Bienvenidos a Dive in. Welcome to Dive in. Mabuhay sa Dive in Kapistahan. Udvasdun ka Dive in Festivalon. Tapro pa sa wit na Festival Dive in. Buhi mabayim. Bolit loritanon. Dive in utsabe. Apna de shokol ke jalay. Shadow amontran. Benvenuti al Diving Festival. Diving Festival in Hoshkadis. Yes, we're ready to start. Just wait if you hear me, please. Very good. Hello, my name is Felipe Stevenson, and I am happy to be here today to host the uh, Diving 2020 Festival. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a communicator, a former journalist, and a wannabe writer, storyteller. I was born in Chile, uh, and I've been an immigrant for the past 33 years of my life, first in Canada, then in the United States, and now in Switzerland for the past 13 years. I spent 15 years of my life working in the uh, insurance industry um, for, for Swiss Re. I am in a different industry now, but I'm very fond of uh, insurance and reinsurance, so it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here today and host this event. Um, we are delighted of your participation as well in this festival. Uh, it, this is an industry effort, an industry-wide effort celebrating diversity and inclusion in its fifth, fifth consecutive year. This year, we have more than 100 events in 35 countries. And the most important thing today is that our topic today is quite relevant, is racism and xenophobia in Switzerland. What can I tell you about this? As an immigrant who speaks with an accent, as you can notice <laughs> my voice, and it has a different skin shade, top, this topic is very close to my heart. Although racial injustice is not something new, um, we ha it has been actually taking a lot of our uh, story time in the media uh, after the killing, the uh, unfortunate killing of uh, George Floyd in the United States and the search of the Black Lives Matter movement. So the problem is not new, it has been there, let Latin, but uh, it's something that needs to be addressed. People of color, different backgrounds, creeds and religions experience racism, racism on, a, on a daily basis. Um, openly, obviously, or through what we call microaggressions or stereotypings. This happens in school, this happens at the workplace. Switzerland is not immune to this kind of uh, problem. Although Switzerland is not a colonial, a former colonial power at its neighbors, um, some attitudes and uh, are not uh, encourage racial discrimination, profiling, and xenophobia. This, uh, these attitudes are normally under the rug, but you know they become evident when we have a crisis. Before we we get into and into our presentation, I would like to. Um, go to a housekeeping list. Uh, first, uh, today we will have three speakers uh, who will provide the respective views on the problem and what can be done to tackle it. Uh, but most importantly, we have today four storytellers uh, who will be sharing their poignant testimonies, testimonials with us to, uh, to tell us about their experiences with racism and xenophobia firsthand in their personal and professional lives. During this, during this broadcast, we will put you in mute. If you have a question 
uh, please use the Q&A um, section on the right hand uh, side of your uh, WebEx uh, application. Uh, we will try to answer your questions as much as we can. Uh, it's all a matter of time. Um, hopefully, if we can not do it during the presentation, we can do it at the end. I also ask you to avoid interferences with uh, the broadcast to put away your uh, mobile phone, your cell phones uh, from, from the broadcast uh, in case that may be interfering with, with the um, uh, signal. Uh, we will be conducting a poll throughout the, um, the event. Uh, we're going to have three specific questions in this poll. We'll, uh, we will kind of want to gauge uh, your feeling about racism and xenophobia in Switzerland. Uh, with that, I would like to move to the next slide. Hold on a second. I'm going too fast. Um, I, um, I'm having kind of a technical problem to show the question here. Um, I, I will read it out. I thought it was going to be uh, on, on the screen. Uh, so uh, what person, what, what do you believe, what person, uh, percent of the population in Switzerland considers themselves victim of discrimination and violence? Is it 12%, 20%, 28% or 40%. On the right-hand side of uh, the application, you have the poll. And please, I, I ask you to, to answer, and we will provide the answer at the, at the end of this uh, segment. While you're doing that, please, I will um, be happy to introduce our first speaker of the day. Uh, his name is Urs Berschi, and Urs is currently the CEO of Reinsurance EMEA for Swiss Re. He also happens to be an executive board member of the Swiss Re Group. Uh, he's also the sponsor of the Global Mosaic Initiative within Swiss Re, uh, which is a task particularly relevant to uh, this global topic that we are addressing today. So with, without uh, further ado, I would like Urs to come on, on this virtual stage. Very good. Thank you, Felipe. Let me just do a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. I see you nodding. Very good. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, and thank you to all of you for joining us here today. I'm delighted to be here as a supporter of the Dive-In Festival, both personally as well as on behalf of Swiss Re, where I'm the global sponsor for diversity and inclusion through the lens of race and ethnicity. I'm also joined by many Swiss Re colleagues who are quite passionate about today's topic of racism and xenophobia in Switzerland, including the management team for Europe, Middle East and Africa, where we just cut a meeting short so all of us can attend here because this is important to all of us. And I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit more about myself and why this uh, topic is important to me. I grew up here in Switzerland, uh, in Winterthur to be precise, and I left here for the first time when I was 16. I wanted to go see the world. And since then, I've lived and worked in Asia and Latin America, the US and Europe, and I've just returned to Switzerland after 25 years away, about a year ago. So my own personal perspectives are rooted in Switzerland, but also very clearly global in nature. Which brings me to some of the very sad recent events around racial violence and social injustice around the world. And as Felipe has already mentioned, I trust that everybody on this call has followed the news of the tragic killing of George Floyd, the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement. And what this has done is, you know, it's really shining a bright light of just how far we still need to come as societies globally on the topic of racism, discrimination, and social inequality. When I first left Switzerland, I moved to a small town in South Carolina in the US where I lived in a predominantly black community. And even then, I saw some of the problems that we were having, and I'm sad that not more has changed. And I want to do my part to make a change for the better. It's also personal for me because of my family. So my sister's originally from Sri Lanka and grew up here in Switzerland her entire life. My wife has Filipina roots and grew up in the US. And both my sister and my wife's family have experienced racism. So I'm also doing this for them. So this is my personal motivation. And then from a Swiss Re perspective, 
we firmly stand for a diverse and inclusive workplace culture, and we do not tolerate discrimination for any reason. We also clearly recognize that we have a broader role to play and we want to do more. And I volunteer to be the Group Executive Committee's global sponsor to help in these efforts. We have taken a series of very specific and expanded actions and activities. And on this call here, I'd like to highlight two of them. The first one is allyship. So this is what I'm doing, that's what some of you are doing and other leaders are doing, and it is my request to all of you and your colleagues who are not able to join, please be visible, be outspoken. It's not enough to not be racist, but we need to speak up when something is wrong. It's simply the right thing to do as decent human beings. And the second one is around awareness building. So the level of comfort to acknowledge and talk about racism and discrimination is clearly not the same for everybody. And that's okay, it's an individual journey, but it is absolutely crucial that we commit to doing more and doing better. And that starts with an awareness that there is more and doing better. And that's an issue in society. Now that brings us to our session today. Uh, in Switzerland, the topic of race and ethnicity is not discussed as frequently as in other countries, but it should clearly be an important part of any DNI agenda. In fact, there are studies that show that racial and ethnic tensions are quite common in the workplace in Switzerland, and we should take this opportunity to learn more and promote awareness on this topic. So at this point here, um, what I wanted to do is actually take a look at the poll and see how that's shaping up. And uh, very good here. So the vast majority think it's around 28%. I'm gonna build a little bit more suspense because we're gonna get to that in just a second with our next speaker. And that really sets the tone to turn it over for the rest of today. Um, and I'll now turn it over to Martine brunswick Graf, and she's the president of the Swiss Federal Commission Against Racism. And she will provide additional insights on the topic from a Swiss perspective. Thank you for being with us today and over to you. Uh, it's my time to speak. Yes. But I need to have uh, something to, to be helpful with the uh, slide, please, because it's not, I don't receive from Felipe. Okay, I hope I can. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, can you help be helpful? Because I, I cannot, I cannot uh, move the, the slide. Okay. Oh. Can you move it now? Okay, I am ready. Thank you. Uh, no. A moment. Ah. No, it's not okay. I will move the slides for you. Just let okay, me know, Martin. Thank you. I, I do that when 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 we need. Okay, the so first one, please. I'm sorry. No problem. So you can go, please. Yes. Order. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I am very glad to be with you today because it's a big occasion to speak about racism and Switzerland and uh, companies and what we can do together. Because it's not a question, uh, Switzerland is not a racist country, but Switzerland has racist issues as other countries and we, not, we have to recognize that and we have to work with So the first of all is to know where we are in legal framework and basic rights. And here we always, we have to repeat and to precise that the first topic is the federal constitution because the federal constitution guarantees every person living in Switzerland the right to equal treatment. But as another question, it's not a question to precise that as equal treatment because the constitution doesn't speak about racism as, uh, as such, 
But the Constitution precedes that the prohibition, uh, the prohibition of discrimination. That's very important, and such a discrimination could be a, uh, about origin, race, gender, age, language, social status, way of life, religious or philosophical belief is very important, or a political one too. And we have in the Constitution two discrimination uh, 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 is prohibited with physical, mental, or psychological disabilities. That means we have all the topics in the Constitution without precision only about race or others, but the only article say prohibition of discrimination. Further? Thank you. So, what we have too is a legal framework in criminal law. And we have to know that because criminal legal framework are not in, uh, as in every country. That means we had, it to, we had to, to vote about legal framework and it was in 1995. It was not so easy to, to become the things because only, as I remember, 54% of the population accepted that at the moment. Here we have uh, very important things to know. Prohibition and discrimination in the criminal law is for publicly things and for hate and discrimination. That means if a, a person doesn't do that publicly, we don't have to, we cannot apply this article to 261 b which is a very important active in criminal law against racism. And we have to understand that, we understand that because that could be that other artists will be needed. What about? It's about race, ethnic origin, religion, and sexual orientation. I have to precise that you can criti criticize a religion, but you cannot say discrimination, powers, or hate, of uh, discourse of hate, or, or something like that against people because of their religion. It's very important to understand that in our, in our time, in a, because it's a big discussion about Muslims and others, and we have to understand that like that. So what happens? It's forbidden to disseminate ideologies, and that means publicly. It's forbidden to have propaganda campaigns which could be public not only in a small class, a small, uh, small environment. For instance, if you are a very bad party, a party, that means, uh, uh, how do you say in English, um, right, far right party, for instance, you can have session, you are not forbidden in Switzerland, but you cannot do that publicly and you cannot uh, do uh, the disseminate propaganda for that. That's what is forbidden. After that, as you say, action could be verbal action, written, writing, picture, using gesture or other acts of aggression. It could be physical, it could be moral. And one some, uh, something more in Switzerland, you cannot deny a genocide which was recognized. And it's very important because we have not a lot of genocide which are in the moment recognized and it's internationally recognized. But if you have a denial, if you deny that, you can be uh, following the criminal law, you can be you can be condemned. After that, if you the last thing could be important for you to, to understand, any person who refused to provide a service to another because of the race, ethnic, origin, the religion, and so on, sexual orientation, because we wrote about that. So it could be it could be it could be punished, but it has to be provided to a general public. That's the right and legal framework that we have with criminal law. What you, the risk is three years not more than three years in, in, in prison or a monetary penalty and we have for a year, I would say, 40 cases which can be condemned for a year from the beginning of the criminal law application. Then, next one. Next one, please. 
very quickly, because I don't want to, to, to mention all the topics, but here you can see that we have private law too and this, uh, about discrimination, but we have no law mentioning at the private, in the private law about discrimination. That means you can have in Swiss civil court uh, measure about legal personality rights, you can have protection of the personality as, uh, as such with an article in court civil, for instance. You can have, if you are in, uh, in, uh, in the workplace, you can have the same uh, with an article in the code des obligations, and everything could be applied, but at a very, very short level. And I would say we don't have in Switzerland any mention in a private law about against discrimination. And you cannot apply to private law only saying, okay, it was a case of racial discrimination, and uh, you can do something because you you know you have an, uh, you have a special measure for that. That's a problem I have to say because if you see here, you can see that we have that with Gender Equality Act, for instance, or for Disability Discrimination Act. For this, uh, we have a special law, but. Against racial discrimination, we have no special law. And it's a discussion yet with my commission to know how we can, how we can go further, because until yet we had no political majority for that, I would say. What are the problems here to solve? Next one, please. Okay, well, well, we do want to, to do something, I would say. And here what you see is following. You can see, you have the answer to the question that was in the poll, if you see on the slide, because it's 28 people of the population who consider themselves as a victim. But what we can know here, we can know that if you, it's a regularly, it regularly polls about diversity and coexistence in Switzerland. We began, that means uh, the state began in uh, 2016, 16, 2018, and we are doing 2020 yet. What we know is that the population is, it, there is a sensibilization about racism. If you see that 59% of the population consider racism as an important social problem. And that would be the important things to say today. That means in our country, we know that there are problems of racism, and you can see every two years when we check about uh, the abuse as a poll, we can see it's 60 or 59% regularly. After that, what is the problem with where we can do that? We will see uh, what happens and when. Uh, what, uh, what happens and where? I would say which person are the particular victim of racism. You see on the, on, the, on, the, on the slide here, Muslim, black people, Jewish people are the most. But I have to mention two people living in another way. And here we are speaking about people, we are not living in a house, but in a, in a, they are moving themselves. And uh, such people could be a, a problem with racism. So we can perhaps change, the, and you see here, I cannot read my, my own <laughs> at work. The most important, what happens is at work, 25%. So we can see the next one. And in the next one, you will see that in contrary, we spoke about the victim, but here we are seeing something else. A third of the Switzerland population say they could feel uncomfortable when faced with differences and otherness. That means we have to be careful here because it's a signal. It's not something it's not a majority, but it's a good third, and it's very important to, to understand what is the problem in such a case. After that, what is the most problem they have? It's with another language. And here we are not speaking about national languages, we are speaking about 
foreign languages and I was very astonished when I discovered the result of the poll because it was the first time we had to, to see that and that means problem at work could be speaking another language as an official language. I would say it could be that it's not English, I hope for all you, for you all, because <laughs> it could be very problematic, but that's a question. After that, I will say we have to try to, to, to find some solution after, but not only about language, but everything could happen at the, at the work. So we can change the slide, please. What is interesting to know, it's a ground of discrimination here. And you say for the people that feel victimized, I would say the most it's nationality. And the time of diving is racist and xenophobia. And here you can understand that nationality could be a problem for people What is the problem exactly? Professional position and the last one is ethnicity as such. As it's interesting to see because it's a difference between ethnic and, uh, and nationality in the case and we have to work with that. We are not sure about everything and we have to study because here it's difficult to understand the link between the both. I am, and you can see skin color and religion are a topics too. But the most important is natural, nationality. Thank you for changing. Yeah. Yes. Felipe. Okay, here it's interesting uh, what is what I said before between language and work, um, working place, and you see that here because so this discomfort caused by the presence of people are clearly when they are speaking another language that at work. After that, in the everyday the everyday life, and after that, neighborhood to both uh, to both the same. But you. I, I have no solution about what you can think about that in your company, but you have really to think about that. So perhaps the next one, please. So here, what what we can do at the, at the legal level, I would say, the first important problem to know is reduction of the burden of proof. And it's a topic, it's a very tough topic for politics because in our legal legislation, in such cases, burden of proof, it is on the end of the victim and not of the, of the, how do you say in English, the theater, uh, the, I don't know, but you understand. The, the acting person, we, do, we are we, we speaking about racism or something like that. But you have to know that burden of proof uh, uh, is an obligation for victims. And it could be very difficult to prove anything in a, such a case. Because you are a victim, you say something, and you have the other person saying something else. And how can you prove when you have no, no person, no other people, and you are alone with the person? It's very difficult to, to have that. And it's very difficult to find the right way to do reduction of the burden of proof and we are discussing that at the moment with the commission in some uh, legal text that we can try to, to put on it. We can strain civil law provisions that's very important and because you saw before that we have no discrimination law at private level and we can facilitate access to legal instrument and here it's a question of advice to give to person to be helpful with them because it could be very difficult for people we are we seem to we have to, uh, seems to be victims of racism to find the right way to go to court or to find the right way to to have a, an act of uh, justice 
And after that, the last one is a political topic, very tough because we have no majority for that in Switzerland. It's right of appeal and uh, standing for organization. Because if you are a, a lonely person who could be a victim, it could be very difficult. And it could be needed that we have the help of an organization to be from before the court in court or to go in court with you or to be part of the procedure. And here we have not that in the legal uh, legal matters, and it's a political, really a political issue. And I believe, uh, yes, so the parliament refused that for the last time last year, I believe. So it, it's not on the table at the moment. We can go further. Okay, and yet it's, uh, we, we arrive with concrete things and what we can do with preventing discrimination at the company level. And here I would say the first for me important thing and for the Commission, it's declaration in favor of the fight against discrimination. Because here it could be a text, it could be an internal text, it could be a public one, but it could be good for employees because you can have the agreement of every employee, for instance, when they enter in the company. It could be good for the company itself because it's an innovation effect and it could be an inspiration for all the company. And it could be good for the customers too because it could be a, a reason of choice for a customer. And it would be further and further. I believe the, the topics about racism, about discrimination is a topic which will not disappear off the table of uh, companies. And that means it could be very important at, that, at a higher level. It's not only, uh, uh, only a conference, but uh, it could be a declaration and a commitment to fight against discrimination that every person can receive when, when she joins the, when he joins the company and after could be on the website could be every everywhere and known for everybody it could be very effective and it could be a, a good i would say a good reason for competition because it, uh, it's not only an obligation a social obligation it could be an argument um, a motive of uh, of choice for the competition uh, on the market too after that uh, i don't know if you do that prohibition of exclusive internal competition because you can see here when you have only international competition for 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 people joining a company it could be it happens things that you cannot control and you do, you don't give any occasion for outside people to come and when i am saying outside people it could be migrant people or other people but it could be interesting the third one is very important. It's code of good practices in placement and staff recruitment. And here you have to improve it and you have to control it too and you have to control it at every level, I would say. It's not enough to know that you have regulation, internal regulation in your company, but you have to check if this regulation is applied and how it was applied. And it could be a post control too, not every time, but on a, on a, on a regular basis to, to see if everything is respected. After that, the measure has this staff recruitment that uh, uh, we, uh, we target about recruitment of migrant lab labor. And here it depends what you want. You can check it to see if you have uh, people coming from uh, migrant uh, population, if you want it, how, how, how much percent you have. It's not a question of quota or I don't know anything else, but it could be an aim, uh, aim or a topic for the company too. Sponsorship could be helpful, that mean if you see in your company that you have problem, that you have person with, uh, could be helpful in such cases. Measure to promote equality it's not to discuss this way because usually you have to promote equality in everything. It could be gender equality, it could be racism, uh, race, uh, ethnic equality, it could be anything else, but you have to, to, to promote that and to have the 
right measures, measure for that. Recognition of foreign credentials. Here I have only to say, you have a lot of people coming from region which where the people were studying diplom, I mean, receiving diploma, but recognition is not a topic here. And it could be a very good, uh, a very big problem because you can have people which uh, have a good level of um, of education. They are foreign teachers, they are available ski, but they are not recognized. And check in your company if you have such people, but it could be that they have such such uh, skills, but they are not recognized, and it could be a, a, a good idea for a company to check that when 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 they have the possibility to use. After that, support of victim of discrimination is last one. And here I have to say, it's not enough to have a, a good uh, declaration and to have uh, any code of good practice if you don't check if you have support for victims of discrimination. And it has to be an independent place because it's difficult for people in a company to say that they have problem. And it could be it, a question of confidence and a question of uh, hierarchical uh, problem, uh, internal, uh, internal problem. And if you have the possibility to check if you have an independent place for victims of discrimination or person who has a feel, we have the feeling of to be victim of discrimination, it's very important to, to think about that. It could be very helpful and it's good for the company too because after that I can, it's an independent, it's an, uh, how do you say, it? it's a sparring partner to, to discuss the issues for the, for, the, for the direction of the company. So we can go on the next. And the last. Ma Ma Martin, uh, Felipe it's here. A, Can I ask finished. you to? Uh, yeah, I, I need you to do it in one minute because we're running behind the schedule. Thank you very much. No, I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I'm not sure with you. Okay, you can only uh, read that, never forget. The so fourth one is the most important. Racism is not an opinion and it can become a criminal offense. I am finished. Thank you. So I tried to give the floor to... Yeah, yeah I, I have it. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your insightful presentation um, and also uh, finding out that 34% of people, uh, one third of Swiss people feel uncomfortable uh, when facing with otherness. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite um, scary uh, from my point of view. Um, let's now move to our story storytell segment um, and I would like to before we do that I'd like to run another poll so we can uh, get your um, opinion and we will get the results right away um, so the poll is on the right hand side again is have you personally ever witnessed a situation of racial ethnic or cultural discrimination and did you speak up uh, the answers are no yes and I did speak up yes C is yes and I did not speak up please go ahead while you're answering that, I will um, introduce our panel um, participants today. Uh, we are very honored to, to be here to, to do this, uh, to lead this discussion. Uh, we have three storytellers uh, with different backgrounds, uh, but all uh, connected through their experience with racism and xenophobia in, in Switzerland. I'd like to start with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a quick overview of uh, who they are uh, before we get into the discussion. Uh, we have Suva Umatevan. Uh, she is the CEO of Plan International uh, Switzerland, which is an organization that advances girls' rights and gender equality. Suva was born in Sri Lanka, and she came to Switzerland when she was two years old as a refugee. Um, she will tell us uh, some act of racism and second guessing, I guess, uh, that oh, they often start at school and then they follow you to your neighborhood and then to your professional lives. And uh, especially when you are judged by the color of your skin. We also have Adam Buyondo. Uh, he is a commercial apprentice at Swiss Re. 
Uh, he was born and raised in Kampala, Uganda. Adam came to Switzerland to study business and to join his siblings. Hello, Adam. Uh, he's young, full of energy, and with a bright future ahead of him. Uh, but unfortunately, Aaron has been the victim of several times of race, racial profiling by what we call innocent bystanders or by the authorities, namely the police. Then we have Mariana Maric. Mariana is a senior underwriter, casualty and environmental risk at CHOP. She was born in Bosnia-Herzegovina in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, she came to Switzerland when she was seven and with her family escaping the Balkan conflict. Her father was already a seasonal worker in Switzerland, so um, uh, she had to jump into three different countries before coming to Switzerland and settling here. Um, the, her last name is sufficient to make some people in Switzerland uncomfortable to the point of telling, that, telling her sometimes that her attitude is typical Yugoslavian. She will explain more about that when we give her the word. Then we have, uh, last but not least, Celeste Fogel. She is a senior legal counsel at Swiss Re. Uh, she was born in Ghana, but lived in Cameroon, the United States, and Switzerland. She moved to Switzerland 25 years ago when she got married to a Swiss um, gentleman. Uh, she has experienced um, discrimination for not only for her skin color, her background, or gender, um, she uh, will tell us that no matter how many diplomas you may have, titles you may have behind you, uh, or a very strong CV, you will always ask to be to prove yourself more than the locals, I would say, uh, to, to show that you have the capabilities to succeed in this society. To all of you, welcome. So I'm going to start with Suva, uh, and I know we're running a little bit behind of time, so um, I'm going to going to ask you guys uh, to keep your five minutes um, for your testimonials, and we will try to uh, answer questions and go over some other issues uh, at the end. So Suva, yes, I start with you. Um, you told me when I spoke to you um, last week that uh, some people, some Swiss people, make the comment that you are more Swiss than the Swiss themselves. You have been told this many times in your life. Can you explain a little bit and can you give us more context about this? Go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be part of this event. And I think. Uh, um, I was actually taken aback when I was asked to be part of this panel because um, it's such a it's a topic that has been a very significant part of my life, but I don't think I've ever publicly spoke about it. So this is quite um, quite a, a you know first first experience for me to open up about these experiences. And going back to your question, Felipe, I think um, you know, when people say that, you know, that I'm more Swiss than a Swiss, um, you know, I always keep wondering, well, I am Swiss. And uh, that's that's exactly the, the struggle I probably had is, um, you know, I was raised in Switzerland. I speak the Bernese dialect um, and I don't know anything but Switzerland. So to be questioned um, that you're Swiss or, you know, the identity of, you know, questioning your Swissness, it's quite, it's quite offensive. But at the same time, I think, you know, growing up in Switzerland, I've, I've learned to deal with it and, uh, you know, address it or, you know, address it in a way that has more of a positive effect. And maybe going into kind of more of the details of, uh, you know, what kind of experiences I've had in, in my childhood. I believe um, it, it started with some of these conversations uh, like being called a modern cop and having heard what happened, you know, after the aftermath of um, George Floyd's killing, the Moran Kopf uh, debacle here in Switzerland, I was wondering, oh my God, after 30 years, it's still a topic and that thing is still on the market. And I had completely forgotten that I was called that when I was little. And um, I was I was being called names because of, you know, because of my eyes or the way I looked. And um, because just the fact, because I looked different. 
And, you know, kind of tracking back, and I think looking at Adam, who's actually in, a, in an apprenticeship now, I think I was even struggling to getting an apprenticeship because of my name. And um, and that was a certain kind of profiling as well. And, you, you know, you just, uh, the initial question you're being faced is, oh, where do you come from? And my answer would be, yeah, I am from Switzerland, but uh, I don't think that was a, that was a good enough answer. And, um, and now looking at how my uh, my career has shaped and i think the choice of my career has actually um you know, been based on uh, because I wanted to be part of more of the international structure. I wanted to be part of more people that looked like me, part of, of an environment that is more international. So I ended up in international organizations. But now, having, well, you know, 30 years later, having moved into a more uh, traditional neighborhood, um, you know, two years ago I moved into this place where you know, pretty much it's, um, you know, there's there are not many people who look like me. And our, my neighbor's reaction was mostly you know very very skeptical looks where you know where do they come from do they eat the same thing you know as a matter of fact my favorite food is rocklet and I think uh, I think it's all these stereotypes that people you know have about you and the moment I open my mouth and the Bernese dialect comes out of it people are just like they instantly feel comfortable with you and I think I have that advantage of you know being you know speaking Swiss German, but a lot of people don't have that. And I, I think that's when I realized, you know, how, how much that conversation is still at the initial stages and the platform we have today to open up about it. And I think it's very, very important to have that representation, right? And, um, you know, you know, aiming for leadership positions in Switzerland, I feel like, you know, being from a different, you know, racial background, being a woman, being young, I think it's a triple discrimination. Thanks for your insight, Suva. That's uh, very telling. Um, I would like, in the interest of time, I'm going to move to Adam right now uh, for his uh, story. Um, but your story, it, I'm sure, reverberates with the audience, um, and uh, particularly with 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 us uh, who share kind of the same background that you do and uh, same situations. Thank you so much, Adam. Your turn now. So you told me that sometimes you avoid going out. Uh, with your friends for fear of being singled out. Um, how does this profiling manifest itself in everyday life? Tell us a little bit what it is to be black, young, and, and living in Switzerland. Uh, thank you very much, Felipe, for a great question. It um, helps me uh, get into this story much easier. I'm very glad to be here talking to all of you and to be able to share my story. Um, that question is best answered, um, I can start it from four years ago when I moved to Switzerland. It was my second month in, in Zurich because I moved to Zurich exactly four years ago. And I remember I was with my family and I wanted to see uh, the neighboring countries of, of this country. So we took a train to Italy with my, my sister and my younger brother. <laughs> And on the way there at the border, of course, I, I knew I had to carry my passport and my ID. And I remember, and I remember, uh, I don't want to get emotional with this. So, and I remember I was in the wagon with uh, a full wagon with a lot of other people as well. But of course, we were the only black family in that wagon. And the control came in. And when they came in, of course, I thought they were going to check for everyone's ID or passport. And when they were walking towards me, I, I already got my ID and passport ready. And then I showed it to them when they asked me. And right after they asked me this, they just left and moved on to the next wagon, being the only young black male in, in that wagon. So I asked myself, um, did they not see anyone else in this? In this train or are they only checking for people who look or profile at least like me and from that moment on in my second month here in this country i knew that uh, i was going to have to be ready to get singled out like this which i think from that day on already manifested this kind of fear for me uh, with with going out because even when i'm out with my friends let's say you're in a park or you're out in the city 
but as long as you're the only one who looks different, they will still ask me for my ID or to show some kind of documentation. And of course, being a person who, even if you want to be extroverted and you want to go out, as long as you know that you have that insecurity, that every time you move out, you're going to have to show at least some kind of identification, it will cause some kind of discomfort in you even if it's with the authority. So I cannot tell you that I feel very secure or comfortable around the police, uh, even though they are the people who are supposed to make you feel secure or comfortable in a country. So to answer your question, that is where my fear of authority manif manifested from to this date. But uh, that is, of course, just one of the stories the other things that I, as a young person here, experience, for example, with a name like mine, um, I always got that fear when I was also starting to search for an apprenticeship, like Suba said. I thought that I would have to go through way more uh, being of a different culture. By then, I did not speak the language very well because I started the apprenticeship uh, two years ago. So I was still in the process of learning. Now I do speak uh, Swiss German and German because I study in the language. But still, even up to date, I still have to prove some of these things. For example, in the office, when I get a phone call and someone, I say my name, Adam Buyondo, they will hear it. And automatically, of course, they will change the language and speak English. Or let's say you are in the cafeteria, and even if you're with someone who speaks the language, they will speak to that person in the language. And then when they see your color, they will automatically um, presume that you do not speak the language, and they will change it. Now, there are those days where I do have the energy to fight for myself and prove that, yes, I have integrated and I have made an effort to um, make myself like everyone else here. But of course, as a person of a color like this one, it is never going to be the case because it's not like I have to come out. My skin already comes out for me. So as I said before, there are those days where I will fight and reply in Swiss German just to show that I speak the language. And then there are those days when you wake up and you just do not have the energy for this. So you will just, I do speak English, so you will just reply in English and just hope the conversation comes to an end as soon as possible. And now for me, it has become, um, it has my bar for, I call it my racism bar, has lowered so much that uh, the people around me now are the ones who out outline these things for me or see them for me without even me noticing them myself because I've, I've, I've thrown this offense bar so low, I do not see these things anymore. And they have to tell me, oh, Adam, that was offensive or that was um, racist which I find sad now. It's like I've become numb to this uh, kind of, of profiling or discrimination of all these microaggressions, as I used to call them. But um, with time, even if it's sad that I have gotten used to them, I've still come out to at least spread this message or tell my story. Because like Suba, before I've never had to tell stories like this. But then if it's to raise the awareness and spread these stories, I would will, I will definitely be open to sharing my story more. Thank you, Alan. We really appreciate that you're sharing your story with us. Uh, it is a, a sad reality. Um, and uh, I find particularly sad the fact that you have lower your racism bar uh, just to, you know, live your life in peace. Uh, and this calls for definitely some changes uh, around us. I'm going to move now to Mariana. Um, so Mariana, uh, balancing um, your professional career and the interests of your company based on clients with borderline racist views or attitudes, it's already a challenge for you with your last name. And then if you add the fact that you're a woman and that you also are a student of environmental oh, studies, uh, which can be controversial <laughs> sometimes, uh, it, it's hard enough. So tell us a little bit more about uh, your your uh, your experience. Thank you very much, Felipe. I very much appreciate the opportunity to tell you more about my personal uh, experience as a Swiss woman with ex-Yugoslavian roots. Um, when I was a child, as an immigrant, I. I still realized that I was treated differently because of my origin. 
the most upsetting instances, I would say, um, were, include, or were included, included a subtle discrimination. For example, when I, a person would refer to something negative as typ typically Yugoslavian, but at the same time assure me that I'm an exception. On the one hand, such a gener generalization is, of course, always hurtful. The person might not refer to me, but what about my Yugoslav family or friends? On the other hand, such comments are very insulting because it implies that as a Yugoslav, I cannot be proud of my origin. Yeah. So, um, my early childhood experiences of discrimination or exclusion were mainly based on the origin of my origin or limited language capabilities. Later then, in my professional life, I experienced the rejection not only because of my Yugoslav name, but um, also because of my gender, I would say, and the political view. For example, I recently had a meeting with a gentleman who is a member of a particular political party. Because of my background, I wondered if he would take me seriously. Overall, the conversation went well, but when the client rejected my advice, I was not sure if it had something to do with my origin, gender, age, or political view. I wished that my capabilities were not assessed based on these factors. As usual, the official meeting was followed by an on, on, unofficial part, where we exchanged views about the current challenges in this specific industry. This is when it became more political, or at all political, and personal to me. I was evident, it was evident that we did not share the same opinion. However, this gentleman was a potential client. This put me in a difficult position where I, I had to hold back on my personal opinion and prioritize the company's interest, which may result in an inner conflict. Also, I face difficulties because of my name. Today, I would say I wear my name proudly. Um, and I appreciate my roots, and I'm very happy to contribute today to a diverse workspace. I hope this you. answers your question so yes. far. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I think it does. Um, appreciate uh, your, your, your testimonial. Um, in the interest of time, again, I'm going to move to Celeste. Uh, Celeste, you told me uh, that um, you only realize, um, well, let, me, let me put it in a different way, that you told me that when you left Africa, you became aware of your blackness. Uh, living in a society that does not always acknowledge its unconscious and conscious racist bias against people of color can be, I, I, I assume, and I know for um, personal experience, can be exhausting. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your experience of living in Switzerland and confronting racism and racism, racist comments? Thank you. Thank you, Felipe. Um, um, hello, everybody. I, I had not um, realized um, how emotional it would be for me to um, even prepare for, for today. It's only five minutes, but I, I, I don't think I've ever prepared this much for just five minutes, dredging up um, all of the, um, the emotions that you think you've dealt with and pushed down is, has, been, has been very emotional. Listen, listening to Adam, who is the same age as my son, um, has also uh, made me realize that these are um, experiences that you don't um, you don't necessarily deal with um, in a manner that that um, that that resolves them. Um, as as you said, I, I was born in Ghana and I was raised in Cameroon. The first time I, I left um, Africa to to come to Europe was. When I went to France, 
to go to high school at the age of 15. And um, it, was, it was then that I started to realize that um, I was not, um, uh, that my identity was not what I had thought it was in the eyes of the other. When you grow up in Africa, as I like to say, when you're chilling in Africa, you're not, you're not anything, you, you're just part of your family. There are various ethnic groups, you speak your language, they have, you speak many languages. And when you leave to go, usually it's because you have the opportunity to go to a better school. And so you go on and then when you arrive there, you do your best uh, to, to do well in school because you know how much um, it costs your parents. And so I only, I think I only completed the journey of becoming black when I arrived in Switzerland. And, and when I say this, um, it, 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 the, the, the realization that black was actually an identity didn't occur to me until I started feeling the treatment of what it meant to be black. I remember the first time I, I encountered that was when I first arrived in Switzerland 25 years ago. I was coming back from work and I was dressed in a suit. I was at a tram stop at Paradeplatz. I was very happy at the time because I had graduated from law school two years before in the US. I'd met my husband in law school and I was, you know, I coming to Switzerland felt like a dream. Why not? Beautiful country. And I was standing there um, and a man came up to me and said, um, how much? And I, naively, I thought, well, um, he wants to know how much the ticket is. And as the conversation went on, I realized that um, he was asking me how much I cost. He thought I was a prostitute. And I was shocked. And, and, and I thought, did, what, what could I possibly have done to, um, to make him think that? And I remember going home and, and talking to my husband and, and actually crying because it was the first time that I understood that all of my, my upbringing, all of the things that my parents had taught me and who I was as a person had been reduced to the color of my skin. And then I started thinking about what it meant to really be black because it wasn't really an identity. And then, for, like as as life went on, we had children, and and the 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 so the the first understanding of being black was being objectified. The second understanding was the criminalization of 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 black people, and this was a shock to me when um, this happened with my son. My son was in public school; he was the only non white student, and I don't say non Swiss because he is Swiss. He was born here. His father is Swiss. And I remember the teacher calling us one day saying um, some money had been taken from her wallet during the break. And she talked to all the students and all of them had denied taking the money. But she told me on the phone that um, all the students believed that it could only have been my son who took the money. And I asked her why. I said, well, do you, um, did anyone see him? And she said, no, they just think he's the only one who is capable of doing it. So I said, well, let me talk to him. So I talked to him and he cried bitterly. He said, you know, all the classmates had been accusing him and he swore to me he hadn't done it. So I called the teacher and I said, I believe him. And a few weeks later, when we had a parent-teacher meeting, my husband and I went to see the teacher and I asked her if that issue had been solved. And she said, yes, another mother had come forward. She'd found the money in her son's room. And, uh, and so I was surprised that the teacher hadn't called us. So I said to her, well, you know, would, would you apologize to, to my son? And she said they had agreed um, with the administration of the school that to protect the identity of the other kid and his privacy, they wouldn't um, want to make a public apology. So with all of that happening in the background, you go and work, right? You think we're resilient, we're pushing through, we've been raised to go through things. So you get to the office and, and the story I wanna share about Corporate experience is not really my story because 
I feel my stories would be make me too emotional. So a colleague of mine just recently told me um, he's black, he's African, he's actually from Zimbabwe, and he was asked to um, interview somebody for a, a role in his department. And when he went to pick up the person, um, she was visibly shocked to see him. So they had an inter the interview and she was a bit confused. And at the end of the interview, he said, um, do you have any questions? And she said, um, well, you know, I, I would really un like to understand how you got here. I don't expect a black person to interview me at Swiss Re. And, and the reason why this story is important is because this is the message that we feel a lot of times, not, not it's, it was amazing that she actually said it because the problem is it, it is so internalized. And, and as I said, we also have now views of what it means to be black. And so there are difficulties for us when um, you, 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 you encounter subtle, indirect put downs. There's a sense that if things go well, you don't get any recognition. If things don't go so well, um, you feel like you know um, you have to to defend your competence, right, more than others. And 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 maybe lastly, um, there's a sense that people don't want to address the issue. So you feel like, you know, you have to, you have to, to take it in. And that is so crushing. Some of the experiences that we go through are so devastating to not only your self-confidence, but also who you are as a person. And so when people talk about bringing their whole self to the job, I'm, I'm so glad that Swiss Re has taken up this this, this big discussion, right? Because it is a discussion that can save lives. There are so many people who are suffering in silence. So I, I am very happy that after 25 years of wanting to have this discussion, I'm finally in a company where this is taken seriously. Well, thank you very much, Celeste, for your testimonial um, and uh, the, 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 the stories that you share with us. Um, I, I am being considered of time, and we are uh, we wanted to have this Q and A um, opportunity. Um, for those who don't realize yet, we have a Q and A on the right hand side, uh, right hand uh, side of the application. So post your questions there, and I will read them aloud, so uh, we can have the participants perhaps answer them um, or uh, the speakers as well. Um, while we wait for some of the questions, I just wanted to share with you that uh, the poll results for uh, the, the previous question. Uh, the poll question of, uh, we came to 42% of people who say that they have personally witnessed a situation of racial and ethnic and cultural discrimination, and they have spoken up, which is very encouraging. Um, but what there's a lot, there's a long way to go. Before I start reading the questions, I would like to ask each of the storytellers today to give us a message of what can we do better what can we do as a society as individuals to change this and to move this racism and xenophobia where it really belongs in the trash can what can we do what can we what can we do again individually or collectively to address this i start with you celeste you were the last one to speak um, thanks, Felipe. Um, so I, I think it starts with an acknowledgement that um, racism is a problem, right? That, that we all have been enculturated with, with um, racist concepts. The second thing is something that happened recently is, you know, someone reached out to me and said to me, um, Celeste, I'm a white male, and I, I just, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't understand racism. And reaching out, talking to people, and seeing the humanity of the people, I think, goes a long way. And, you know, I think we're all 
wanting to have this discussion. We all want this to go away and silence is not an option and not educating oneself is also not an excuse. So I would say people should reach out and, and teach themselves what, you know, what they feel, what, what does discrimination evoke in them? When you hear black, what does it in, evoke in you, in you in terms of, of, um, of feelings? deal with it. Uh, before we, we go to the other uh, participants, I uh, when you're saying that I had the opportunity to watch the other day a video uh, in which uh, some people were talking about what we call um, uh, white entitlement. Um, and perhaps I will ask Urs uh, to elaborate on this, um, you know, from his experience and the way he has lived racist, racism through uh, his sister and his family's wife and himself being a white male. Um, could you share your experience? Yeah, sure. Um, it, there's a term called white privilege, um, privilege and um, yes. it, it, it actually was explained uh, to me in a very powerful way because I have to admit as a white male, I never quite really understood it. Understood it. Uh, and then um, the way it was explained to me is never really having to, um, uh, to, to be faced with something that's holding you back. And the way that it was explained to me was actually in the uh, in the context of somebody who's in a wheelchair, right? So if you if you're not in a wheelchair, you will never know what that feels like. And so you know, with the history, of course, of um, of also you know colonialism and white privilege, I think this is an important concept for us to understand and just to recognize. Also, for me as a white person, you know that this is real. I could never understand what it means uh, for a person of color uh, when they are faced, including my sister, for example, I ask her, I never have had that experience myself, but understanding that concept of the privilege that I have uh, versus, in this case, my sister or other uh, people of color, I think it's a very powerful uh, concept and one that, you know, takes a little bit of time to just process for me as well. It was, uh, you know, it's it's an uncomfortable um uh, topic and, and and process just to to get that through, but you know it's 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 there, right? You know I see it. Absolutely, race is never a very comfortable subject. Um, let's go back to our uh, storytellers. I'd like to ask Suba uh, to um, ask to give me an answer to the question I had before regarding what can be done to address this issue. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the other storytellers as well. I think um, it's incredible to see how how much of the story is similar. I think uh, I could I could relate to all of you, and there's so much resonance to it. And I think leading up to uh, just from my experience, and also from the others' experience, I personally feel you know the context of racism is also important that we recognize that we feel you know we are faced with racism you know when you look at my um, my family they are they, they come from a culture of uh, of colonialism you know they are part from a commonwealth and they left the country as as uh, refugees and i think they do feel when when they came here uh, i mean there's so much gratefulness and there's so much um, gratitude for switzerland that we had the opportunity that we had you know to be safe and to, to have the education for the children etc but at the same time, there's also this tens tendency of, you know, um, I could I could resonate when Adam said, uh, you know, that numbness and you avoid and, you know, what is the point of you interfere or you just kind of pass the note like you didn't hear it. And I think that's probably where it starts, you know, just calling it by, by its name and really calling it racism. You know, people sometimes ask me, have you ever faced racism? I'm like, what kind of a question is that? It's more like how many incidences have you faced, right? And, um, and I think it's just recognizing that people, everyone deserves respect. And I could feel the pain when Celeste was talking that, uh, that she felt, uh, you know, that sense of losing, you know, losing one's identity and dignity. And I think that's the important part of the other side to kind of feel the everyone has an unconscious bias, but recognizing that, that you have it. And the other part is also, 
we're talking about a corporate um, environment today, but I think it starts in schools. You know, when you, um, you know, teachers have such an important role to play uh, in, in educating children and integrating these topics. Of course, they're all overwhelmed. It goes back to gender as well. You know, educating boys about how to treat women or how to talk about these topics. And I think it's it's generally creating, um, you know, social justice and an equal society, you know, whether it's about race, ethnicity, gender equality, everything, it actually starts very young. And the other part is at home. Parents have an incredible role to play. If, you know, I've had experiences where people spit on my, you know, on my parents. And if, if that someone is raising another person, I think that's, that's something to be worried about. So I think it's really calling it by its name and raising the awareness and try to understand the other side. People actually leave their countries, not by choice, but you know they were forced to leave their places as well. So I think have some respect for you know for where they come from, understand their culture. So create kind of a mutual understanding around that. Thank you very much, Silva, for sharing this with us. Um, let's go to Mariana. What can we do, Mariana? To, to change this and how? Hello, everybody. Yeah, it's a good question, very good question. So I would say I, I, had, I have a few ideas. The one uh, is, my, um, is my, my, my priority, or I would say the best or the very important one, um, standing up for the others. What does it mean? So I would say, um, what is needed is more support from third parties. If they hear a racist statement, a generalization, or that someone is cornered, that this person becomes active in a conversation. In Switzerland, in such a situation, why, uh, one might be rather neutral, and one does not want to be part of a dis discussion. However, the support of third parties, or let's say from outside, is absolutely necessary. Thank you very much. Adam, um, could you tell us from your experiences and your standpoint, um, what can we do, what can we, what can we do and how can we done? Um, we are spreading these stories to awaken the, the ally in you because we want alliance now. Because we're a minority group here, we're not always going to be everywhere to tell this story. But as long as we bury this ignorance and you understand it to everyone else, then we are going to have allies who are going to help us spread this awareness so that we do not have the ignorance of there is no racism in Switzerland, like my teacher said a few weeks ago in class. And this is a teacher who is teaching young Swiss students. And if she says something like this, then it clearly shows that they believe that there is no racism in a country like this one. And of course, for, my, for the next generation, me being a young generation, it, it saddens me to know that uh, there are people out there who are even born here who go through this. So I would want this to change even for um, the young people out there, even the older people out there, because now this is two generations sitting in the same room. I'm right next to Celeste here. And it's quite sad that the things she went through are still going on even for a young person like me. You would think there would, there would be change, but there is still... Um, nothing that has been that there's not as, as much change as we would want to see and for the people of color my message would be we should stop walking around on stones and not speak up because up to now i have noticed that we have been uh quiet about this for a while now but then the more we speak up then the more aware everyone else is that would be my message very powerful message thank you very much to you adam and to celeste mariana and suba um, we are going to move to the next segment of our event today. Um, before we do that, I would like to ask another question. Um, 
the question, I'm gonna, we're going to post it on the polling section on the right-hand side. Um, it will appear in a few seconds. Here we go. Have you ever felt uncomfortable in the workplace interacting with individuals of different racial, ethnic, or cultural backgrounds? And you have four, uh, four answers there. Please go ahead and answer while I take the time to introduce our next speaker, who is, happens to be Jörg Tuz. Jörg is an advisor and global relationship partner for PwC. He leads the insurance advisory and people organization capabilities in financial services at PwC. He will be adding some insights on the, from the PwC perspective uh, and will present what uh, it's called a color brave exercise, uh, which is basically a takeaway activity to the participants of this um, event today uh, to facilitate self-reflection, as Adam mentioned before, and awareness, as Celeste also said on the topic. Um, what, before before we jump into Jörg, I would like to see if we have a counting of the polls uh, already, just to have an idea. It will come up. So I'm going to move to York. York, the floor is yours. There you go. I'll give you a presentation, right? So you can go ahead. Can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much, Felipe. Um, hello, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Also from my side, a very warm welcome. Um, wow, I must say this event has already been so powerful and, and emotionally moving that it makes me feel even prouder to be participating and and helping to raise awareness for a topic that's also very close to my part, uh, heart and which I'm also very passionate about um, because of personal professional connections experiences. Um, now for the last few minutes I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we as leaders can do to raise awareness and, and, and drive those positive actions in our organizations um, which I think is a good place to start because we all part of of uh, uh, of a professional life. Um, first of all, let me very briefly introduce myself. So I'm a I'm a PwC advisory partner based in Zurich, leading here our, our insurance practice in Switzerland. Uh, whilst I was born in Germany, I've spent most of my life abroad, um, moving to Switzerland six years ago. Um, but I've spent most of my life in in the melting pot that is London. Um, and also lived and worked in Africa, Asia, and Americas. I'm not quite getting, or it's not quite adding up to Ursus 25 years. I think in my case, it's probably about 23 years. Um, but I consider myself uh, um, truly international, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm proud to have a, a truly multicultural circle of friends. Um, I'm a psychologist by background uh, and spent the last 20 years helping clients transform the organizations and creating a culture that drives performance. Now, for me, that really means a truly diverse and inclusive culture where everyone feels welcome and appreciated so they can bring their best self to work. I mean, a lot of us who work in insurance um, like it because of its critical role it plays in protecting people and the livelihoods in our society. I mean, we're supposed to be the good guys, and uh, we need to take this positive cause and purpose to ensure that we are truly diverse and, and inclusive in, in everything we do. Um, I think over the last few years, there's been progress made on the gender side of the diversity and inclusion agenda. But if we're all honest with each other, probably less so about race. Um, I think I've got similar experiences to everyone in this session um, in, in that uh, I've met many people who think there's no issue in Switzerland 
because there just aren't the same racial tensions uh, in, in the US. But I mean, let's not make no mistake, these powerful testimonies that we've heard really tell a, a, a story and every single one left its mark and I think give us the energy to do something about it. Um, I'd like to introduce you, therefore, to an, to an initiative that we at PwC have been developed and that we're driving throughout our organization, which is called Color Brave. When we've, we've come to realize that race is a very uncomfortable topic, and, and far too often we are afraid of saying the wrong thing, of being politically incorrect, um, and, and, and therefore kind of we just try not to talk about it. Um, and I think it was just said by the, by the panelists that the only way to overcome this is by talking openly about it. We have to call it out, otherwise we, we don't make progress. I mean, at PwC, we, we do pride ourselves about our purpose, which is about building trust in society and solve important problems. Um, and nothing seems at the moment more prevalent and challenging to our community and society than race. Um, that's why we as an organization with 20, 200, 276,000 people um, feel a responsibility. We feel compelled to develop ideas of how we can play a positive role, how we can stimulate self-reflection, how we can stimulate discussion about what we as leaders, what we as individuals, um, and, and as our organizations and, and as a society can do about it. Um, ultimately, what we're trying to, to achieve is being comfortable with the uncomfortable conversation. Um, what can I say? What can't I say? And, and really ridding ourselves of biases that exist by putting them out in the open. Having, having these conversations require us to be open, courageous, empathetic. Um, because the worst thing we can do is to avoid it and brush it under the carpet. So that's why we have developed Color Brave, um, an initiative and discussion guide for ourselves, for our teams, for the various leaders in our organization, and, and, and for larger groups, and, and also for our clients. Um, this is a, I don't know whether you can see it, but this is the, uh, the copy of, of Color Brave. Um, and, uh, and everyone will, uh, will get a copy of this um, at the end of the session. Um, it, it is basically um, set around three sets of behaviors. And uh, let me just move to the next slide. Um, it is about three sets of uh, behaviors that we feel are, are really critical to, uh, to embed in our organization. Um, it's about being curious being bold and being forgiving. Um, and, and, and these three sets of behaviors are really being used to trigger um, key sets of actions. And, and everything starts with self-reflection. So, uh, so the, guide, the guide helps us kind of starting to self-reflect and starting to kind of give these topics some structured thoughts. So to pick an example, how comfortable am I speaking up if I observe a lack of diversity? Um, how often do I seek opportunities to learn about other races and cultures? How often do I take a chance by opening myself up? Or how often do I reflect upon times I've made an assumption based on someone's appearance? So this is really about kind of putting an onus on us, trying to self-reflect and, 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 and trying to kind of become aware of the biases that we have ourselves. Um, the second part is really about then opening up and sharing our experiences by creating opportunities to talk about it. So if I then go to the, to the sharing part, again, it is. Uh, you're, it is you're, uh, sorry to in, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we are actually running out of time. Running out I, of time. Can, can you can you can you can you close it up in in the next minute so or so? I can, I can, you will be sharing this. That's all right. We're, share, we're sharing this. We're sharing this. So there's more. There's more to look and and there's more actions that uh, uh, and experiences that we can share together with the guide. 
Um, I, I think for me, just to closing is, is what I said at the beginning. I think the most important thing is to speak up, put it on the table, um, and, and let's take steps no matter how uh, small they are. Um, for me, race is the proverbial elephant that needs to be eaten in chunks. Um, if some of those chunks are getting bigger, then even better. Um, and for us, it's about moving from colorblind to color brave. So I urge us all to have those conversations, being bold, being courageous and empathetic. That's probably as much as I wanted to say, Filippo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, uh, we are already uh, at the time uh, of this event's end. Uh, there, we have I, we have received some questions. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have a, a chance to to answer them specifically, but I believe that some of the um, responses from, particularly from uh, the the storytellers, have answered those questions. Other uh, comments that we receive are uh, to highlight the highly uh, emotional uh, testimonials you have given today. So people have really appreciated that, and I think this is a great opportunity to um, to kind of end our uh, diving festival. Uh, so allow me, please, to um, to tell you that we have approximately 172 people joining today. Um, and we appreci appreciate their, uh, their commitment to, to attend this, this meeting. Uh, I would also like to um, thank uh, Martin, Urs, and Jörg for the respective presentations. And I, obviously, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Suba, Adam, Mar Mariana, and Celeste for sharing their powerful stories. Um, this is, uh, on, on, I would also, you know, we need to thank the people who are organizing this. So I'd like to thank the organizing committee and also the 17 sponsors that are supporting this diving festival. Before you go, don't forget to do your part to change the status quo. And so that's the message I'm giving you today. When it comes to racism and xenophobia, we need to change that. And we have the power to do that. Thank you so much. We'll see you another time.